The sex steroid hormones, testosterone and estrogen, of course, are involved in reproductive biology, but they are both vitally important, provided they are in the proper ratios, for motivational biology and for the following reason. The steroid hormones are are so-called lipophilic, and they can cross from the outside of a cell through the cell membrane to actually into the nucleus of a cell and control gene expression. So when we achieve wins repeatedly, and again, this doesn't matter if you're male or female, you achieve wins repeatedly. Testosterone is the molecule that eventually accesses not just cells to control their immediate physiology, but goes into the nucleus of those cells and controls their gene expression and what it translates. So, so, yeah. so does that mean, okay, so does that mean that demotivated men are producing less testosterone? Uh, we can say that the, the data show that repeated failures yeah. take testosterone levels lower than they would be otherwise. That is not to say that people with low testosterone will always fail. Those with higher testosterone no, 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 always no, win. No, I, but it would just to be clear, because I no, no, right, you're, right. you are correct, but just I, people sometimes get hitched on this causal part. But indeed, one of the quickest ways to boost someone's testosterone is to have them achieve a win of some sort. Now, the win is translated. Well, one of the things you do, one of the things you do in behavior therapy constantly is you help people calibrate the zone of proximal development. So imagine that that's Vygotsky's term, right? And so if you're in the zone of proximal development, you're pushing your skill development one increment forward. And it's one that you can actually manage. And so if you see people who are entirely stymied, we're sort of back to the cup of coffee or the coffee cup example, you want to find something they can do locally this week that would constitute at least a micro win. And you just keep, and if, if you talk to someone, you say, well, clean, why don't you try cleaning up your room? Because it's a complete catastrophic nightmare. It's a good place to start. And this is often the case with people who are really demoralized and whose life is utterly chaotic. And maybe they come back later and say, well, you know, I had one client. He, uh, he just had a child, eh? And he didn't want to mess up this child, but he was living at home. He was like 35 years old. He had a child out of wedlock by accident, but he didn't want to be a useless father. And he was very afraid he was going to be. And he had good reason to. Like, he still lived at home. He lived in his high school bedroom. And it was a complete bloody mess. He was living like a 12-year-old, you know, a bad 12-year-old. And so I said, well, when was the last time that your carpet was vacuumed? And he said, well, sometimes my mother does it, but it's probably been months. I said, well, why don't you just bring the vacuum cleaner into the room and... Uh, just vacuum your carpet. That'll be your task for this week. You know, and I knew that was a bigger task than you might think because he'd been in that room for like 18 years and it was a mess. And so cleaning it up at all was a big deal. He told me that he dragged that bloody vacuum cleaner into the doorway and left it 45 degrees across the doorway and then stepped over it for the whole week without actually using it. Oh my goodness. It. Yeah, resistance, say, eh, from, that was resistance from a psychoanalytic perspective because he, he saw the monster and was paralyzed. And so what we did was we reduced the task. I said, look, you've got some drawers in your, in your bureau. They're probably a mess. Do you have a sock drawer? Yes. It said, like, clean up one half of the sock drawer this week. That's it. Just organize it. So you just keep cutting the tasks down week by week until you find the threshold for positive movement forward. And then is, what's cool about that too is there's a Pareto principle issue associated with it. So if you can find out where the person can start, it isn't linear progress, it's exponential progress forward. And so even if they have to start at a micro level, it doesn't really matter because they get much better at it very, very rapidly as they accrue successes. Maybe that's because they're learning in the way that you described. Okay, so back to the gene regulation. It increases testosterone, the wins. And yeah, so testosterones are associated wins. Do Winners tend to be able to win more. There's some, um, et cetera. But, you know, if we want to bring this into the, the common world, you know, a few years back when I started doing some public-facing education, I started getting a lot of questions, especially on YouTube from young males, um, about porn, pornography and masturbation. And, and this becomes very relevant here. We have to remember that this dopaminergic system had, is generalizable to many different behaviors, right? Academic pursuits, uh, sports pursuits, relationship pursuits. But fundamentally, it was, again, I wasn't a, a consulted the design phase, but fundamentally, it's tacked into the, the adaptive survival behaviors. And every species, including ours, has at least two major um, motivations, which is uh, to protect its young and to make more of itself, to make more young at some level. People can opt out of that, but 
One of the, the absolutely pathologic situations for any animal or human is to be able to access repeated dopamine surges without effort or any pursuit that's self-directed and, or that's directed, I should say. Mm -hmm. So for instance, cocaine, a drug which potently increases dopamine or methamphetamine, which potently increases methamphetamine, but doesn't require any sort of um, adaptive action pursuit, except to acquire the drug and spend money on no it. No sacrifice. No sacrifice. So what, essentially what ends up happening is the circuit that gets rewarded is only the drug seeking behavior and no other behavior will give the kind of potent yeah. dopamine release that cocaine or methamphetamine will, which is why they are so pernicious. Now, likewise, right, right. I'm not- Well, plus, plus they have that powerful reinforcing effect, right. right? So not only do you get that kick, but what's reinforced by the dopamine release is the behaviors that were right prior, particularly right prior to the ingestion. And if it all that is, is the drug taking behavior, that's all that develops. That's right. You build that monster inside your head. That's right. So I can see where you're going on the pornography. Front. Right. So I was starting to get a lot of questions. I was kind of surprised. I thought, well, you know, I'm male and, you know, maybe that's why they feel comfortable asking. But if you were saying that we're asking about pornography and they were asking, you know, I, I, I realize we want to, um, you know, to, I'll just be direct about, it. they were asking whether or not masturbation was bad. They were asking whether or not um, masturbation with ejaculation was particularly bad. And here's my stance on this. I'm a biologist and a neuroscientist, not a psychologist. But what we know for sure is that if an individual repeatedly engages in this circuitry, let's say, say masturbation and pornography with increasingly um, potent forms of stimulation that are on a screen, yeah. a couple of things happen. First of all, what's being reinforced? What's being reinforced is a high dopaminergic response to watching other people engage in sexual behavior, which is very different than being in a first person sexual experience. Okay. So right there, you know, that what's being reinforced is not actually any kind of improvement in communication yeah, skills. It's voyeurism. It's voyeurism. And and as these questions started to come in more and more, I started to realize there was a lot of kind of undertones of people talking about fear of or experience with sexual dysfunction that clearly pornography yep, can lead yep. to. And here I'm specifically talking about males. I, I actually don't know the literature on females. So here I'm talking about- Females don't use visual pornography to the same degree. I see. They use literary pornography. I see. So- yeah, yeah. So, and then you start to think about, okay, what happens in the cascade or the arc of, of sexual arousal and, and orgasm? What happens is that initially there's a, a it's parasympathetically dominant, meaning if somebody is too uh, stressed, they actually can't engage in sexual behavior. The arousal response doesn't occur. Erection is blunted, but the actual orgasm response and ejaculation is strongly associated with the so-called sympathetic nervous system, which has nothing to do with sympathy, it has everything to do with, it's a kind of a stress response. And then it reverses to a parasympathetic response. And then a hormone called prolactin increases dramatically after ejaculation in males. What does that do? That blunts dopamine release and testosterone for a very long period of time, which makes sense if pair bonding and sort of, you know, in our species anywhere, there's this idea that then other molecules would be exchanged with partners, pair bonding, potential for raising mates, et cetera. Without getting into a huge discussion about that, the point is this. Masturbation and pornography are potently tapping into the dopamine system and can undermine mm -hmm. the very processes of what I consider healthy processes of finding a mate, you know, dating, communication, eventually, if it's appropriate, sexual well, interaction, et cetera. Like it's undermining pair bonding. And pair well, bonding. So, okay, so here's a question. If, if, you're, if you're seeking sexual release through pornography and you go through the whole cycle and you get a prolactin release... Do you bond with yourself? Huh. So this is very interesting. The, um, it's, the biology explains it as what's left there is a kind of an open loop, a kind of an emptiness, right? Because bonding with the self is a, is a complicated notion. I mean, it ha there's a healthy version of that, of course, loving oneself and, yeah. um, and, and yeah, self-referencing. Yeah. And, and again, this is more, uh, your dom far more your domain than mine in terms of a what a healthy self-relation is. But in the absence of uh, a real partner there, of an absence of real sexual partner, there's an open loop of neurochemicals, including oxytocin and prolactin. The dopamine, remember, dopamine goes up during pursuit, anticipation, then peaks and then crashes below baseline after orgasm and ejaculation. So this kind of low that people fear is putting them into an A-motivated state. We can think of this, if I were to kind of expand on it, would be it's this, it's this kind of um, neurochemical, psychological equivalent of making your home environment filthy for a while. 
not actually putting you into this positive amplification of dopamine. So it depletes the dopamine system. And it's likewise in drugs of abuse and addiction, it eventually depletes the dopamine system. Initially, there's a huge dopamine surge with drugs of abuse like methamphetamine and cocaine. But over time, people are using more and more to achieve what is not such a great high. You even see this a little bit with um, kind of consumption of energy drinks. Like people are taking more and more chemicals within their energy drinks and they're thinking about loud, fast music, energy drinks, it's kind of stacking of dopaminergic tools. Now that's not as pathologic. In fact, I'm, I'm, there are some energy drinks I'll occasionally drink and I enjoy them. Um, I don't think we need to be entirely afraid of, of pursuing or engaging in things that release dopamine, obviously healthy sexual behavior, food that we love, social engagement, all of these things can be dopaminergic. It's the big peaks in dopamine that are not associated with any prior effort or organization of self that are particularly dangerous for the human being. Yeah, well, you could see that, that you could see that, that that's a cardinal danger of of uh, affluence. Then that's right. This is why the children of right. uh, you know you know that's right. You, you know you cannot get rats addicted to cocaine if they live in their natural environments. Is that right? You can only get rats addicted to cocaine if they're isolated rats in a cage. Yeah, they won't bar press for cocaine in a natural environment, and it's because they have alternative sources of dopaminergic gratification. Very interesting. So, yeah, yeah the, it's very interesting. Yeah, the children of very wealthy people who are overindulged, I, I've seen that many times, many, many times, and it is a very sad sight. Um, yeah, well, they're not optimally deprived, eh? And that, that issue of optimal deprivation, that's, that's a killer issue for an affluent society. Hope you enjoyed the discussion with Andrew Huberman and Jordan Peterson on the, the dangers of easy hit dopamine. If you found this video informative, please consider subscribing and liking it. Thanks for watching.